Chasing the Rainbows with your host, Bernice Quisenberry. Hello there, survivors. This episode is called Triggers All Around. I'm flying solo this week, and we are discussing different triggers that come up when we return to society in front of people, when we're out in public, um, things like that that happen to us that when we least expect it. Um, and, you know, we are doing these series of segments for October's Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. And these aren't just for us survivors because we live this every day. We already know this. But it's also for our support systems so they can know how to better support us, family, friends, colleagues, loved ones who are there in our corner to spread, you know, how to truly comfort us in the time of need when we do need it most. And so we are discussing triggers that us survivors don't realize may be difficult until we lose our babies. And it's not things that I thought about either. So with our last episode during the Brie and B segment that we did with expecting the unexpected, we kind of tapped into a couple triggers, um, just discussing, you know, different topics around, you know, discussions that occur out in public and things like that. And then, you know, we did dive into like one or two. And actually, some survivors wrote in and said, you know, it would be nice to have an episode where we do talk about, you know, all the triggers that people don't realize, um, because these kind of conversations and opening up this dialogue around this um, helps us to not feel alone. And it also allows our support systems to know how to truly be there for us, right? So I'm just going to dive right in. Um, A couple, you know, feelings that occur when we're dealing with going back out in public, like I said. For me, the grocery store was very hard. Clothing stores, Target, those kind of things, right? And it's not that... I wished ill on anybody when I'm going to bring up some of these triggers, but it was really out of like a jealousy, sadness, anger, all in one that was stirring all around like a hurricane and this overwhelming moment of feelings when this would come on. And it just like crippled me, um, you know, during this time. And so one of the things right after we lost our daughter, Brooke, was seeing newborns. Um, that was really hard for me. That's why one of the most difficult things when I went out to run errands or do anything, you know, with routine life was seeing newborns, hearing them, um, anything like that. And like I said, not because we wish ill on it. It's just, you know, I was so wanting and yearning for my own baby that seeing the baby, you know, would just stir it all back up, especially if it was a female, just like Brooke was, you know? Um, so it was that it was like handprints, footprints, just little baby things, right? Like, like all of that. And I'll I'll dive into that a little bit more. But something else, too, was pregnant women because, you know, we delivered Brooke when I was 28 weeks pregnant. And so she passed before her due date. So when I was, you know, walking around the rest of the seven weeks without her up until her due date and seeing pregnant women, I was like, oh, well, I should be at that point or I should be doing this. You know, that's what it should look like for me. And we didn't get any of those things that happened, right? Because we were robbed of it all. So like robbed of doing um, like the the right kind of baby shower. We did have a baby shower, but it was kind of like in a rush situation. And, you know, because we thought we were going to be bringing her home and, and all of these things. And it just wasn't the same. It, it all, um, and very grateful for it all, but it just you know, she passed two days after our baby shower and she was in the NICU. So I had to rush from the baby shower to go in and see her in the NICU. So it's like you never were fully, you know, enjoying these things and these moments because of the worry, the angst, all of that. Right. But yeah, so seeing pregnant women for me um, during those last couple of weeks was extremely difficult. And then after losing her, too, because then seeing them carry to full term, having babies, because, you know, If I'm having babies, you know, my friends, loved ones around my age are having babies and things like that, too. Um, So we have that, you know, in common. And then seeing them being able to take their baby home and everything's okay. It's not, like I said, like we wish ill. It's just that jealousy. Like, that's just what I wanted so badly um, during that time. Also, our doctor's office was a huge trigger for me, and I did not realize it was going to truly be until I had my 
you know, follow up, check up appointment. And I pulled into the parking lot and then I just had like a meltdown. And, you know, it's just that constant reminder of walking in those doors. Like the nurse didn't know what happened because obviously she wasn't there in the operating room when um, we were having our baby. So because I was at the actual doctor's office, not, you know, in the hospital. So then, you know, seeing our doctor again, like all of it was just so triggersome. And then sitting in that waiting room and seeing pregnant women, too. And I wish, you know, OBGYNs, different offices would have separate areas for women that aren't pregnant and women that are pregnant, because, you know, if we're dealing with infertility loss um, or fertility loss, you know, and on an infertility journey. If we're dealing with multiple losses, if, you know, we just went through a baby loss, pregnancy loss, anything, you know, it's just so hard to see that and be around it. So I almost wish, you know, that could be different. Um, But, you know, seeing the doctor that delivered um, our daughter was very, very triggering for me and hard. Um, And I honestly couldn't do it for a rainbow baby go back there. And that was just my own thing. Um, So hospitals, not just I walked one time back into the hospital after we lost our daughter, the one that we the one that she died in. And I could not go back after that. Like this overwhelming feeling, panic attacks, sweating, just anxiety, everything around it. It was so difficult. Um, And I mean, I'm only using the word difficult because it's really hard to explain. I know listeners out there who have had to do this, you understand what I'm talking about. It's unexplainable and undescribable. Those feelings that you get, it almost feels like I'm having an outer body experience as, you know, I'm walking and it feels like I'm just like floating through the air and I feel like everybody's looking at me. It's like all these feelings that are just like rushing through you and it all then seems like it gets magnified, all these feelings, and they go from like zero to a hundred in like 2.5 seconds. So you know, there was that. But then also the monitors and the noises. Um, when our daughter started crashing on her monitor and all of those beeps and everything, I didn't realize this, but, you know, we got home watching TV, watching the news. Um, all of that was really triggering. Now, watching TV because I would like to watch the medical shows and things like that. And people are crashing all the time. Monitors are going off in them and all of that. And And it would always stir up all of these feelings and emotions. And then also, you know, watching the news for some reason, like I just couldn't see any more tragedy or any more unexpected losses that were happening in our world or, you know, um, any major life events that were occurring, disasters, anything like that. I just couldn't hear all that negativity because I already had enough of that going on in my own head with everything that was going on. So that was very, you know, overwhelming, triggering everything for me. Um, Something else too, which I was really surprised about was strollers. Um, I, you know, would walk into, you know, a department store, Target, things like that. And I would see a stroller in there, or I would see someone walking a stroller outside and it would just like set me off. And like, I would least expect, you know, a stroller, but it makes sense because, you know, we had our baby stroller ready because I was planning on walking and running with my my newborn, my daughter. So it was just a lot of that. And, it, and then I think it brought up memories. Well, I know it did. Um, and probably what caused this too was it brought up memories of things that I envisioned doing with her and wanting to do with her. And that's really, you know, what made her, like I said, because I like to run. That's one of my stress relievers. That's what I consider like the way of my meditation. And so when I didn't get to do that and then seeing these people that were able to, it just like really affected me um, to the point that like sometimes I would have to like walk out with my cart just sitting there in the store and just like leaving it abandoned and walking on. I, I hate doing that because I worked retail when I was younger, but it is, you know, it just is what it is. And it's for self-preservation purposes. And the same thing with you know, how I would do grocery pickup and I would do things like that for self-preservation just so I didn't have to expose myself to this because it is so draining when we're going through these overwhelming feelings and these triggers are coming on and then we're having these physical, mental, emotional reactions to it and it does. It just like completely embodies us to the point 
that I'm just fully exhausted and have no more energy left. And just from, you know, the day and already all the overwhelming, you know, emotions and feelings that I've had all day long. So it's like carrying the world on your shoulders at this point. Um, of course, baby aisles in stores, I couldn't go down them at all. Passing them was even hard seeing the, the words up on, you know, aisle 15, baby aisle, you know, it just was all of that, um, baby food, just everything. I just couldn't, could not see it. Um, baby clothes kind of mentioned that before, like anything like little socks, um, shoes, anything. And, you know, like I said, we had our baby shower just a few days before Brooke passed. And so we had all of these items, all of these clothes, because this was the first time we were having a baby girl and we didn't have any of those items. So that's what a lot of people got us. And it was so hard to see those clothes and knowing that our baby was never going to be wearing them again or never wearing them in general. So it was just so difficult with that. And, You know, I had to store them away. I didn't know what to do with them. I didn't know if we were going to keep them sacred, if we were going to use them for our next baby because some of them were gender neutral. Um, And we ended up doing a little bit of both with them, um, with with our rainbow baby after. But I think that was a really hard decision to know what to do with everything, you know, after we lost her because they were all intentionally for her. So that was something I really struggled with. And, you know, I wish that and grateful now that we have, you know, the daily support groups that we do have. But, you know, talking to other survivors, I wish I would have brought that up to ask them what they did, because like those thoughts in that moment are so overwhelming to know what to do with all those items. And, you know, having somebody to like almost hold my hand or guide me, you know, or a couple people telling me different things that they did so I can find my own way would have been so beneficial in that moment Um, or, you know, moments because, there was a bunch of them and, um, you know, I would obsess about it. For some reason, um, hearing crying babies would really just, yeah, I would just melt and I would start bawling. And, you know, I think the hardest thing for me was thinking like, oh, is that baby crying because they need something or their parents not paying attention to them? And this is like all that I made up in my head, of course, you know, Um, of course, babies cry. That's a normal reaction. And they're doing it because they do need something. But it's not that anybody's like doing that. to. It's just, you know, in my mind, I'm like, like, if that was my baby, you know, I would make sure that they need, you know, it just it was so difficult. I can't explain it, but it really was. And it was like almost, it does. I was comparing myself, comparing situations, comparing how I would be if that was my baby and things like that. And it wasn't, like I said, to down the other person or to do anything like that. It was just a natural reaction to my grief. And it was a natural reaction to not having my baby here and wanting nothing more than for Brooke to be here with us, you know, during that time and now and and forever, you know, Um Oh, yeah. Another uh, trigger is definitely dates and times for me. Um, Brooke passed on a Tuesday. She passed at 1 12 p.m. on March 16th on a cloudy day. And her due date was April 30th. So all of those like Tuesday, 1 12, all, all that is just every, it depends on the day. Um And, you know, a lot of times we don't get answers with our losses. So there isn't enough studies out there or technology to really say what caused our miscarriage, stillbirth, infant loss. And it's living in the woulda, coulda, shouldas. And if I would have done things differently, could I have prevented this if I knew this? It's questioning and always guessing ourselves. And our minds are just constantly filled with those thoughts and those feelings. So when these dates do come up, especially at the beginning, at least for me, the times came up and I would see them and be aware of them, you know, it just all would come flooding in and it would just be really overwhelming. Um, and eventually, you know, I I still do get fluttered with it and I'm, you know, years out now from losing Brooke, but I do still get fluttered, but it also isn't as frequently and it's not as, um, as long either and it's not as overwhelming so it has dissipated and almost like calmed down over time but it still happens and it's not as constant which is which is good too um but you know it still does especially around major dates and events holidays all of that 
who a big, big uh, trigger for me was social media. And I think it's because of the glam and the fakeness that we can see on socials. For me, I had to stay off of them. I got on them initially to, one, I wanted to announce that Brooke was born, um, you know, after a couple weeks of taking it all in and and then finally feeling strong enough to let the world know that she was here, she was alive, and we did have her, and we also lost her in the same breath. But I wanted people to know because I didn't want to feel like I was keeping her a secret. And... But in the same sense, when I was on there on socials and posting things and mentioning about her, you know, I'd get on and then I would see my friends that were, you know, pregnant or ones that just had babies or them and their newborns. And it's just like all happiness and like sunshine and rainbows. And then here I am so miserable, so, you know, sad with everything that just occurred that, you know, it was just hard to watch all the baby videos, the pregnant people, gender reveals, baby showers, all that Um, And I don't know, honestly, like what hurt more, a friend of mine, you know, was getting ready to have another baby. And she kept it from me because she didn't want to tell me um, in fear of, you know, it hurting me and things like that, which I was so grateful for. But in the same sense, too, um, I wish, you know, if she would have came to me because I wanted to be there for her, too. Yeah, I it would have I in my mind, like. I would have been hurt, right? But it's not anything that she did wrong. I would be happy for her and happy that they were having a baby and things like that. It was just like my own stuff and I had to work through it. And that's the thing. Like I had to, you know, like even though I needed my support system and I needed, you know, survivors alongside of me, we also do need to spend some time alone to process different things and how we're going to handle it in a healthy way. And so, you know, it it is really hard um, navigating that and and knowing, but, um, you know, but to me, like social media, I just, I had to stay off of it, just like the news. I just could not expose myself, you know, to any of that after a while. Um, And if I really needed a good cry or, you know, I was feeling a certain way and I did get on to see those kind of videos and things like that it was almost like I felt like was I being a masochist to myself to look at these things right like did I want to feel that pain um you know to, for some reason or other I don't know um so yeah it like I said grief is just weird you just don't know how you're gonna go or where you're gonna go with it um it's just whatever you know feels right at that time But I do know one thing. I did feel very isolated and alone, and social media did not help that at all during, you know, the first couple months, um, year into our our loss after Brooke. So, Um, you know, something else, too, that was hard for me was when I did return to work, I returned in front of people, and people would ask me how I'm doing. And at first... I would say like the first couple days, first couple weeks, like people were like pretty understand why I was like not doing too good, you know, like just lost her daughter. But then after that, people would ask and it was almost like they were just doing it to like check it off their list because then when I was like, oh, still not doing good, you know, still missing our daughter, still trying to deal with it and process it all. And they were just like, oh, okay, like walk away. And it would make me almost feel bad. And it got me to a point that I almost had to start like lying about how I was doing and churching things up to make others feel better or to not get those awkward how are you's or people like see me coming and like walking in the other direction to like isolate myself even more. But honestly you know, I wasn't doing that well. Like I was still grieving. It takes, you know, this is going to be a lifetime for me. And it's like, just, I need to process it. And if you're going to ask me how I'm doing, I'm going to be, I have no bandwidth or mental capability to sit there and like lie or church things up when you're asking. But then it got to the point that it was like, you know what, it's just better if I give them a standard, I'm doing all right, or I'm doing okay, I'm doing good. Like just to say it and then just be done with it, even if, you know, it wasn't truly how I was feeling and then just save it for, you know, the ones that I could be honest with and talk to. So, you know, I think that was like really hard because 
I just wanted to be honest with people and didn't want to put on this this fake facade because what if I did all of a sudden have a breakdown or start crying or feel a certain way and just like need some time to myself or close my office door and not talk to anybody, you know? I just, I thought like honesty was the best policy, but in this instance, you know, People don't like talking about baby loss. It's awkward and it's horrific. So, you know, it just made it easier to deal with people that I would see on a regular basis. Um, you know, family gatherings, anytime um, just doing like a get together outside of the holidays. And, and like I mentioned earlier, the holidays too, but like it was it was hard because I would envision, you know, what it would be like with our baby being present and being around with all of our family and what it would be like if I did have a newborn with me and they were experiencing all of it and I was experiencing it, you know, um, and just how my life would be completely different at that time with two children. And so I think, you know, that was just really hard to to deal with. And then also on top of that was, um, you know, family and loved ones, it's hard for them to bring up the baby or bring up the baby's name or, you know, especially during those family gatherings. And it's almost like the elephant in the room because I'm obviously thinking about her. I'm emotional. I need to take some steps away during the day and things like that. And I almost feel like sometimes, you know, our loved ones, and I get it, I know why they do it. They don't want to bring it up because they don't want to make us sad or emotional, but we already are. That's the thing because we're already thinking about all of this. Um, and we're already dealing with it. And, and every family gathering and holiday, I'm thinking of Brooke. And it's more often than just the average every day. Um, and not that I don't think about her every day. But now, you know, further away from my loss, I do. It's just not as constant. And so, but during, you know, big significant days like this, it does. It hits It hits a little harder, you know, and and being there and constantly thinking of her. And then with each, you know, family gathering, each holiday, we're getting further and further away from our baby. And, you know, we're getting away from the time that we had with them, the memories that we made, and we slowly start to forget little details about them. I was in support group the other day and actually uh, found myself crying. And, you know, yeah, I get choked up and things like that. And if hearing other survivors, of course, because, you know, I know their pain. I feel it because I was there. I know. Um, just like, you know, our other volunteers do. And it's like, how do you document the smell of your baby? How do you document, if you got to hear your baby, how do you document their noises that they made outside of a video? And the further away I get from Brooke, I feel like the further away I remember all of those little details, even though I tried to journal as best I could about it when she was, you know, here with us and, you know, after. It's still... um you know, like the little things, I just, I forget the over, I mean, I remember the overall feelings. I remember, you know, the big things with her, but it's the little things that it's just not as, it's not as easy. And, and I'll never get back, you know, like I said, her smells, her noises, like those kind of things that I didn't, you know, or couldn't find the words to document. And every baby smells different, <laughs> you know, and and I'll just, I'll never get that back. Um, so I think it is. I, it's just, it's emotional. And, you know, I, here I am, caught me completely off guard, you know, years later. But in those first, you know, weeks and months right after losing her, you know, when I started to get further and further away from her, I was aware of it and it would, it would just completely take me to my knees, um, you know, and feel like it, it crippled me all over again. Each time I was like, Oh my gosh, I forget what this is like, or I forgot what this was like, or what it was like to hold her. There's just everything, you know, and it, it just is so hard. Um, and the way that it hits you when it hits you and how it affects you is just, you know, it's just all different. It's, it's, you know, everybody handles it differently. Everybody processes it differently and you can't explain it. Um, and you know, we never, you know, get to our final destination with grief and there just is no, 
end game here. So what we do like is to armor ourselves, like I said in the beginning, and we put things that work to help us cope and we put it into our toolbox so then we can pull them out and use them when we need it the most. And so, you know, I had to learn on a whole different level than I ever did, like how to cope with um, this kind of loss and living, living with it after Brooke. And so there was a few things that worked for me and it was like trial and error too, like the things that would stick or wouldn't stick. And one of them was journaling to Brooke. And this was huge because I needed to first write to her to say how sorry I was that I couldn't protect her inside of me, that, you know, I wish I could have done more for her, that I wish I would have advocated more for her. All of those things that I felt as her mother that I should have done and should have been able to do to protect her because that's all you know, like we're supposed, like, so how I felt was like, I'm supposed to keep her safe. I'm supposed to keep her inside. I'm supposed to keep her until 40 weeks. And then she comes out and she's born and I'm supposed to, you know, do all these things. And when that doesn't happen, I just felt all this guilt, all this remorse. And even though, you know, these things weren't my fault, the, the birth, the, you know, delivery and, um, you know, why she passed, but you just, you, it's just overwhelming and you do. And I played that blame game. And those woulda, coulda, shoulda, you know, so I had to get them down on paper. And so the beginning of my journaling to Brooke was really that it was I had to put that all down there and leave it there and do it multiple times to almost like ask for forgiveness in myself from her and and things like that. I also used a lot of fidget toys, spinners, um, stress balls, a gamut of things whatever I could find that worked to kind of keep me like almost more focused, if that makes any sense. Um, Because, you know, it was really hard to focus on anything when I had all these overwhelming feelings and thoughts going through my head all the time. But it at least gave me a sense of being present where I could touch something and it got me to kind of focus on that object and then pull me back into almost like a grounding technique of it. Um. Something else, too, was talking about her and saying her name. And, you know, today I have a community who doesn't judge me and only embraces me and, you know, and living with living with this pain. But um, it also gives me the opportunity, you know, to talk about her like in public in front of people, bring her up. And it's so healing for me. It almost cuts my pain in half each time that I get to share about her, share about, you know, her her story and our story together. Um, It takes away almost that power that it has on that. And it makes it more of, you know, the life that I had with her and trying to, you know, just find the beauty of her, not that that situation and of course not losing her, but just the beauty of our story together and that time that I will always cherish with her. I also took walks and I then started to run too and listening to music and that like I said was my form of meditation and that was something that I had to continue to do and I still continue to do especially during you know those high stress times because I'm trying to find healthy ways to cope and I don't you know want to turn to anything that isn't and so allows me to still live in the moment be able to process it but also in a healthy way and I pound it out on the pavement really is how I do it and then being out in nature and just taking it all in taking in fresh air you know in the sun those kind of things um and then this was this is the biggest one for me is helping others and it's no matter if it's assisting someone at the grocery store to get items in their car keeping holding a door open for somebody just like little things too Um, Nothing that I want credit for or anything or like, you know, taking a friend to an appointment, picking them up, taking them somewhere, like being there with them when they're struggling, um, calling to check in on a friend, making a meal for someone who is sick, dropping it off, you know, volunteering at a nonprofit. It all makes me feel so good um, when I do that. And it takes me away from self. And I also say this to other survivors all the time, like especially at the beginning when we need to ask for help because it is so hard to understand that concept of actually needing to ask somebody else like how did you do this or why or, you know, just around that because this is a whole new territory for us, right? And so I say, you know, that feeling that you get when you help somebody, right? It's It makes you feel good. You just... 
it like takes you out of yourself for a second and it allows you to like get all the the feel goods like I said you know you just you feel positive you're excited you're happy that you're able to help somebody and it does it get you out of your own crap for a couple minutes and maybe even hours and so you know when you don't ask for help or you don't go to someone that is depriving them of that opportunity where they feel like they can help you and talk to you and listen and them get you know the feel goods and to be able to be there for you so you know that's why it's so important that we do rely on each other that we're there to lean on one another because we all need help sometimes and that's okay so i thank you so much for tuning in and listening to this segment I hope, you know, the survivors out there find this helpful, their support system finds this helpful so they know how they can be, you know, there for for us fellow survivors. Um, And please follow and subscribe to our podcast to help us reach more survivors. And we are always with you, fertility, pregnancy, and baby loss survivors. Until next time, we appreciate you tuning in. Talk to you soon.